All right, I'm delighted to be joined in studio by two-time Paralympian champion, uh, Mark Rowan. How are you? Very well, thanks, Nathan. Thanks for having me. It's, what, it's coming up in six years since the London Paralympics? Yes. You still like the sound of two-time Olympic no, champion? No, I still cringe when I hear it because <laughs> see, it feels like a lifetime away now. For f- six six years. Yeah. Now, it's only a while ago since we were looking at Rio, but I see some of the guys, um, the Irish Paralympic cyclists, are out in Rio this week competing today actually okay the world. so they are actually still using some of the facilities they are they sent pictures back of some of the roof was burned but the velodrome has survived I know some of the pools have been in shabby condition mm. but the velodrome so they're competing as we speak actually so best of luck to those guys so we haven't heard from you for a while what are you up to? Oh, I went back when I retired I went back to study uh, an MBA in sports management with Real Madrid and the University as of you Europe. do yes as you do yeah well I thought I better get, enter the real world and get a bit of uh, bit of education. Yeah. Uh, and then I uh, did some internships through that in Wembley Stadium. Went out to San Jose State to work with um, their soccer team. There's an Irish guy called Shane Crew out there from Kilkenny. That's the coach. And actually, he just got a job with Monterey Bay as the head soccer coach. Oh, not a bad job. Uh, and then I came back to Portugal uh, to uh, set up a cycling hiking retreat, and I started working with. Uh, Quinta Lago down there lately in their latest um, sporting uh, centre so they're building a state of the art pitch uh, tennis courts high performance unit down there for teams to come and train but also for the locals to, to use as well We'll get the promotional aspect out of the way first you're here talking about the Real Madrid Foundation clinics what's the Real Madrid Foundation? Uh, the Real Madrid Foundation is the arm of, of the Real Madrid football team that promotes sport uh, promotes uh, education, promotes um, integration, uh, promotes marginalised uh, members of society, I suppose, through sport, using sport as a tool. Uh, and the, they're in over 70 countries throughout the world, over 750 clinics. Um, so there hasn't been, hasn't been one in Ireland ever before. Okay. So what it is, we'll be bringing uh, academy coaches from the Real Madrid Academy over to Ireland, uh, over to, we have two camps in Dublin in the National Sports Centre, uh, the National Sports Campus uh, in uh, DCU will have two camps, uh, one in June, one in, in July. And we'll also have them in UL, AIT and NUIG. So it's a chance to bring... Are these straight up football camps? Soccer camps, 80% soccer and 20% on the educational uh, socio-development of a, of, a human, of a player, you know, and it's all built on the Real Madrid philosophy. So you look now and you see the likes What's of... What's the Real Madrid philosophy? Um... That I suppose be the best that you can be, you know, and give out, give the people who 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 have a chance, I suppose, to be able to learn from the best people in the world. Give give them a chance to be able to learn from the coaches who have helped coach Lucas and uh, Carvajal and some of the best players coming through Real Madrid at the moment. So, is this for everybody, or are they looking around the DDSL and Kennedy Cup squads and they want the best of the best? And it's it's, it's half a scouting mission. No, it's it's absolutely every, like, so. The coaches are Real Madrid coaches, so we're not selling it as a, as a scouting a scouting mission. But uh, it's for absolutely everybody from seven to seventeen, and for boys and girls. So it's not we're not we're not we won't be doing uh, any fitness tests or <laughs> skill 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 tests for people to enter so uh, I, and the, the whole reason behind it was because when I was studying there I, I had spent um, nearly two weeks with Alan Kearns foundation over in Zambia before and I saw the work that those guys had done in Zambia with the Alan stars and the, how, how sport played such an important role on the development of kids in a disadvantaged area there and the opportunity it gave them so when I was in Madrid I learned about the foundation, so I approached them to say, "Listen, I have a connection in Zambia, and they said, well, you know, we need like we like to work with partners." So as a result, I set up a company here in Ireland, uh, and they use the funds from these camps to fund the social camps throughout throughout the world. And as as a result of being, you know, getting the license to host the the Real Madrid camps here, we also get to do social projects in Ireland. So we'll be setting up four social projects around Dublin, Galway, Limerick. Uh, actually, uh, Galway, D- Dublin, Limerick, and Athlone. Okay. In what the coming sort of years. Ah, oh, well, we, you know, the the obvious one is to work with youth. Um, I spoke with uh, Gordon Brett down in Athlone, who had mentioned that uh, Willow Park, a soccer team there, would be working with uh, refugees from Syria. Uh, we also looked at. Um, something I want to do is work with the elderly. 
the senior citizens see can we use sport, sports to promote their sport we're still open to ideas and to uh, people who think it might be a good fit for them definitely to get in touch and let us know yeah what's what's the best way of getting in touch uh, with you? it would be to google I suppose Real Madrid Camps Ireland or else uh, the website is uh, FRM so Foundation Real Madrid Clinics Ireland mm. and that's the same if anyone wants to get involved take part in the camps over the summer exactly they get all the details there yeah there's a Facebook page and an Instagram page alright very good a uh, chance to work with Real Madrid coaches doesn't yeah. come along every every week so yeah, and, and for the kids but we're also looking to recruit some coaches as well give them the opportunity to work along with them um, and it, we're, it's a very early stages you know Yeah. Uh, but the whole process behind it is to use sport as, as a tool to give people the opportunity to, to become the best they can be you've done a lot since you retired how long is it since you finally decided oh, that 15. you weren't going to go to Rio 2015 due to a classification yeah remind us of that because I, I don't think people maybe at London 2012 because there was so much interest in the Paralympics people started to get on top a little bit of classifications but it was only when I heard of your retirement and just how complicated it can get and how one inch here and one inch there can make such a difference to people's mm. careers can you talk us through why ultimately well, you came to the decision well, to retire when you say inches like that's so my level is T1, T2 it's where my break is uh, within hand cycling there's five different classes Okay, so this is it's already getting confusing but uh, on up until 2014 if you were uh, from C four to C7 or if you had a similar injury so if your heart rate was affected your lung capacity your ability to recruit muscles to pump blood around your body uh, so they were saying physically you were the same level you compete against each other so that meant I was in the H1 category at the time then they opened up two other categories they introduced uh, another category where people with severe uh, disabilities would also cycle so with hand impairments uh, and then they revised the process in 2014 and because of the complications, they just drew a line. They said, OK, if your break is between C3 C or C4 and C7, you're out, you're, you're in this group. So they didn't take the other factors into consideration, like, you know, heart rate, sweat mm-hmm. responses. Uh, and it just became black and white. So as a result, my classification changed to say, OK, we will, because your break is here, you're now in this category. So the reality was that so people who stayed in that category, my own category, who were beating me by 10, 15 minutes at the end, you know. So in 2012 was the last gold medal I won. Mm. 2013, I was second, third in the road races, fourth, fifth time trials. But I was gradually getting getting pushed out of the top. Uh, so for them to turn around and say to me, well, you're, you're physically, you're not, you're in the wrong classification, I'm thinking. You know, I was in the classification, I was thinking, you know, you're, you're basically ending my career here. I said, have you actually looked at the results over the last three years? Oh, we have, yeah. And I said, well, how much did I lose by in the last World Championships? Oh, we don't know. I said, well, 20 minutes. In a road race, it's a lifetime. So, so somebody who had a, a C7 injury, which is the neck, they might, they might have hand impairment, but they might have full uh, trunk. Okay. And that's a big difference because you have more muscles to push the blood around the body uh, to stabilise going up hills and stuff, recruit more power. So the, 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 and I, and I, like, I don't blame them because it's hard to have a category where it suits everybody. So for a couple of years it suited me and then you're just put into another category that like they did stuff with cerebral palsy athletes where they start recruiting or classifying leg amps mm. and then, it's, then they suffer because the leg amp you see guys weren't as severely some of them weren't as severely disabled. So within the world of Paralympic sports if they decide to change classifications as you go along you could be lucky and you, you might not be lucky. And it usually it's down to numbers because they, they, I suppose they have to keep the happiest, the most people the happiest. Yeah. So it was, and I was aware of it, so it wasn't a massive shock to me because I know the Paralympic sport is... So you knew it wasn't an overnight decision? You knew this oh, was Oh, no, coming. no, it was being revised for two years, so and there was always a chance. You know, my classification was, you know, when it's a grey area, it's down to medical interpretation, you know, because it's impossible to prove these things, really. Mm. You know, they don't use heart rate or they don't use um, a go- like a full cardio uh, investigation into how your heart works and because it's impaired you know depending on the level of disability it's impaired were you fully prepared for it even still even though you knew it was coming mentally that I guess so much of your identity had been built up with the success in London around being a Paralympian around being a champion Paralympian and suddenly that's gone uh, I, d- I don't think so because when you- you know, with, in terms of your identity, 
because you know when you do sustain a spinal injury your life changes mm. like without any control whatsoever just in a split second so it's something you've dealt you've, you deal with change pretty yeah. and you adapt you know you, you you become adaptable pretty pretty quickly and because I had worked, you know, I, I wasn't, this wasn't like a f- dream from seven years of age to become Paralympic Hands. Like, so, you know, when I, when I set my sights on it, then that's what I wanted to do. How long, how long was it from your accident to deciding you wanted to be a Paralympian? Uh, well, after my accident, I was involved with, you know, part of rehab in the hospital. They do brilliant work there with table tennis, uh, archery. And I, you know, I did well with archery. And then I started playing basketball. The IWA were running basketball at the team in Dublin at the time and then the IWA had a sub development officer in Tullamore uh, Orla Dempsey who we got a club going in Athlone with the help of the Maris College so when I got back into team sports but actually I re- remember managing Banlahoun FC which is my local soccer team at the time 2002-2003 and just sitting on the sideline and the boys would be having a cigarette at half time or they'd be drinking the night before whatever and I just thought I, I want to maximise even though I'm in the chair I want to maximise my full athletic potential over the next 10, 15, 20 years uh, and that's when I started playing the basketball uh, and I progressed from that lawn team to play with the Irish team and got to go to international competitions so that's when I really got a flavour for to become the best athlete I could you know as, as a Paralympic athlete and were you fully satisfied then upon retirement that you would achieve that or is there still something burning inside you that wants oh, to compete at, at, at a high level in, in something no that that's gone uh, no I suppose now there's a new challenge you know this, this the Real Madrid Foundation is the new challenge mm. and I want to be to make sure that I offer a good product and people will will get something from it uh, but no when I, when I, I, I all of the stuff that I got as a hand cycle was a bonus everything that happens now in my life really is a bonus so um there's no burn desire, there's no grudges, there's, there's nothing left that I want to fulfill. Like, I still ride my bike, stay fit. Um, so, in terms of that, and you can even see it, you know, as you get older. I don't know if you see it, but you, lear- you lose that, that f- I suppose it's testosterone levels, really. <laughs> but, the, you know, that... Calm down a little bit. That urge, yeah, you've yeah. chilled out a bit, yeah. And, like, and now I... I so, uh, when I'm living in Portugal, I play wheelchair handball. It's a local team there, and we're supported by Sporting Lisbon, so right. sp- Sporting Messine. So we're, we're actually playing the finals in in April, the national finals, and uh, like it's a total different. It's very chilled out. The lads stop for a cigarette in the bus on the way up to Lisbon. Um, it's and I really enjoy it because I'm trying to learn the language, but I'm also happy. Have to you be, a drink span? There is probably just before the game, but <laughs> that's it. There's no there's no Davy Fitz mentality there. <laughs> Yeah, but yeah, you, sport, I think a sport can be enjoyable at that level at the right time. But then now it's just more of a social thing. It's so you, you, you've been doing a bit of travelling and you've been around. When you've been looking at the facilities for dis- disabled athletes in in Portugal and and around the continent and being in England at times, where is Ireland right now? I know it's topical, and and I was listening to the 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 discussions about um, sports grants. The sports grants, yes. And, uh, like, for example, I, I live in a small place in, in Portugal, Messines, 3,000 people. And it's one thing I discovered when I was playing wheelchair basketball with Ireland in 2005, we went to Benfica. And every small place has, even in Portugal, swimming pools, uh, they'll have a soccer pitch, they'll have uh, a gymnastics area, but it'll all be within the town or the municipality, and they'll all use it. Whereas here, like I'm from Athlone, you have Buccaneers, you have Athlone Town, you have mm-hmm. Athlone GA, and you have the Athlone Regional Sports Centre. Three to four different organisations, all within a mile of each other. And, you know, th- that was a really good, inter- uh, interesting conversation with John uh, Green about pausing everything and just saying, OK, let's do a stock take, an inventory of what we have in Ireland, and saying, what do we need? Because if you've got five different clubs with five different pitches in a small area, that's not the best use of resources, I think. No, that's and, and we probably even haven't really got to that side of the conversation fully yet about having municipal sports centres around the country that we're still talking about, well, the GEA club didn't get this or the rugby club didn't get this or the soccer club did get this and the GEA club are excluded rather than, well, actually, if we're going to be giving government funding, we should place some sort of demand that actually it is open to everybody, that people do get access. And it, it's funny when you're mentioning the names of the clubs, Real Madrid, Benfica, Sporting Lisbon, these are 
could easily just be a soccer club. They, if they want it, they could easily yeah. they could make enough money from just being a soccer club. Yet there's something, and maybe it's the tradition. Maybe this has just always been the way. They're not just a soccer club; they're a sports club. Yeah, uh, I, even with the with the Sporting Lisbon thing, they support the team. But they brought us up to one of the games at half time, and they brought all the supported clubs onto the pitch at half time, mm. like in in a sport in the in the stadium in Lisbon. And even the like when you talk about there could only be a soccer club. Like I know it from studying in Real Madrid, the soccer team funds the basketball team. And then the soccer team will fund all the social projects throughout it. But yeah, getting back to it, I think, well, even visiting venues around Ireland f- to host this camp, I was blown away by the facilities that universities have in Ireland. It's incredible. UL, amazing facilities. AIT, amazing facilities. DCU, amazing facilities. NUIG, amazing facilities. The sports campus, the best in the world, really. Mm. But when I visit all these, most of them were pitches were empty when I, when I visited most of the... So are they getting the best use? And then each university will put in a commercial manager. They have to maximise revenue on each... So whereas what, if it's with a club, they can look at the bigger social social impact of having a venue somewhere. Uh, and yeah, I, th- I think the, the, the Portugals and the, the Spanish, they've got a better hold on it at, at the moment, I think. Mm. And it also means on on quite a basic level, you can you can tap into that club a lot more in terms of the support. They take pride in in what you're doing with a basketball team, same as they do with the soccer team. Whereas, like an example, and you don't want to put the pressure on on just any one club within this country, but Munster Rugby or a brand like that, if it suddenly becomes a greater thing than just a rugby senior men's team that you've not just got the women's rugby team you can look into other sports you, they can be this big representative body that, that has this support base that people are already tuned into like it, it, it seems something actually quite obvious for the country that would actually tick an awful lot of boxes Yeah, I, I suppose you do get a certain amount of it with the J you know, with Gaelic hurling, mm. handball maybe the music, I don't know if it's the music side of it part, I'm not sure Born and old. Yeah so I suppose we have a we have a certain amount of it, but yeah, it would be good to see it replicated. It would be you know to see a town say, we need this many pitches, we need this, and everybody using use them and tap into them. Mm. Uh, but I think it, it's a long term, it's a long term project, and there has to be a bigger step back to say this is for the greater good of Ireland instead yeah. of this is for a, a small club. We need to get this many people on. So you're doing you were doing a master's degree in sports management. Was that just based on your experience? Something you felt you would be good at? You'd looked around, saw there was a gap in the market, something you could contribute to? I just didn't basically want to work for a year. So. <laughs> Fair <laughs> enough. I know. I, I, I love to travel and love to get an outside perspective of the sports industry. Yeah. I remember when I studied in DCU, did a, a degree in sports management and went to Australia to work with the Australian Paralympic Committee for three months. And I just see the benefit of... Uh, learning as much as I suppose I can from other countries bigger countries that have um, you know more more people more businesses more opportunities and at the time the, the Real Madrid NBA was ranked top 10 in the world so and it's like I love I always loved watching Spanish soccer from back with the Galacticos time so I thought how cool is this <laughs> it was brilliant you know to be able to um, did it live up to the hype yeah we, you know we got to go to the stadium uh, look at you know the, the basics of operations of um, I remember visiting the week of the Barcelona Real Madrid match, and it was um, the security. You know, we got to go see behind the scenes security, everything that goes into it, and like the biggest security threat at the moment for a stadium is uh, drones. Okay, someone flying Dro- something, dropping in something in, yeah, and they're using they're using hawks to take them out. At the moment, they have snipers on the roofs, but they use hawks. Uh, like I would even be interested in you know the how everything how everything runs. So in they're the giving you a pretty broad base that it mightn't be managing a sports team performance on the pitch. It could be becoming a stadium manager. Exactly, it could yeah. be a security manager. Just the uh, ah no, not like now we we visited um, also Bilbao basketball team Basque region. Okay, and how forward they are with their esports. They have an esports team. They bring people from all over the world, live in houses, and they compete. Uh, so you see the next stage of. Of the sporting world, I think it will be esports. We went to visit NFL teams, NBA teams, universities in America. Just getting a really good global grounding of sport and the opportunities are out there. 
And you're going to bring in all these learnings back home at some stage? I hope, yeah, that's my plan is is to come back and manage Westmead to an all Ireland at some stage. <laughs> Why not? Why not? Are you, like, are you, when, you come, when you come back home with all this that you've seen and been to all these great sporting organisations and learnt a little bit here and there, do you come back home and look around at some of the things we're doing in Ireland and, and raise your eyes to heavens or, or are we doing all right? Oh, amazing. I think, yeah, well, I think we're too hard on ourselves sometimes. When you see, and on most of the places I've gone to, there's always a GA club, you know, and I think they're brilliant. Uh, yeah, so I'm obviously a big fan of the GA and then soccer in Ireland. Um, and even the basketball. I heard, listened to Karen Donny lately talking about yeah. the basketball. Uh, and, the, the, you know, I remember watching the, as a recommendation actually from your show, the, the, the Satanta Sport documentary on basketball and the... Hanging from the rafters. Hanging from the rafters. I was just blown away by how strong basketball was at the time. And... Um, yeah, people in Ireland have massive opportunities to take part in sports. Of course, the weather is the biggest; it's the only obstacle. Mm. But um, yeah, I think I think Ireland sport wise, you see it at the weekend with the rugby. Yeah, the, there's a massive appetite for sport here. Yeah, you obviously then really enjoy the elite side of it as well, and you're getting to visit these clubs. But right now, in, the, in your current gig as well in in Portugal, getting to meet a lot of good people and learn from them, and in what's happening in Quinta de Lago, I think it's a pretty popular destination for a lot of yeah. good clubs and a lot of good sports people. Yeah, so like, like the the Quinta de Lago, they're now uh, building a sports campus. It's called the campus, and um, they're bu- you know, built a state of the art soccer pitch. Uh, high performance gym um, outdoor swimming pool tennis court we just held an ITF futures tennis tournament uh, the cycling side of things which I'm looking after we're running cycling tours uh, we had the Brownlee brothers t- training down there and yeah you're getting to meet we met Dillian White who's fighting this weekend who's an amazing uh, an amazing story actually you know, came from Jamaica on the streets lost two brothers that died on the streets came to the UK became a, a kickboxing champion at 17 years of age now fighting he fought Joshua mm. he reckons he'll take him again um, yeah and then we had the Burnley guys down so we had five Irish soccer players there so you're seeing you know the, the, the levels of um, planning and preparation we, we just see the finished art- articles but and I think the Irish rugby team were there in preparation for Tokyo 19 so a year out so you're, you're seeing um, you know on a Monday morning people like to be you know t- to critique uh, performance and everything but when you see the amount of work that goes behind the scenes it's um, it's a real eye opener yes so the high performance side but also the recreational side now is yeah I've seen uh, from follow, Paul, following Paul Kimmage on Twitter he's been over with you doing a bit of, is, is that what your main involvement right yeah so I'm is? looking after the cycling side of things promoting cycling organising events and and is that is that for elite sports people people who are no, seeking out a career in cycling or is it just people who like a little bit of good weather and get out on the bike and enjoy a holiday have you seen Paul Kimmage lately <laughs> and call him elite <laughs> no we're just exploring Portugal staying in nice hotels eating nice food drinking a bit of wine and just enjoying enjoying life out there yeah that sounds alright that sounds alright so uh, when when are you going to take the Westmead job <laughs> they're playing awfully Sunday so we'll see how that goes first but yeah I always keep an eye I love keeping an eye on um, on the club scene and the, and the, the county scene because it's fascinating now the next couple of years are going to be fascinating in terms of the Super 8s and how things go there yeah uh, we will be keeping a very close eye on it here and off the ball anyways so remind us again before you go the Real Madrid Foundation Clinics uh, taking place around Ireland this summer what's the website? is FRM Clinics Ireland and you get all the information there in terms of times, uh, prices, everything you'll find you'll find there. Mark, great stuff. Thanks a lot for coming in. Uh, enjoy the nice hotels, the nice weather, the nice wine. Uh, we're very jealous of the life you're leading over. So in that's Portugal. enough about Westmead. <laughs> Come on. All right, we'll take a quick break. <laughs>